Welcome to another episode of Founders Club. Today we are talking to Chris Crone, one of the top real estate investors in the country who's closed over a thousand transactions and a billion dollars in volume over the course of his career. He's also written several best-selling books on real estate, entrepreneurship, and mindset. And he's a mentor to some of the top real estate investors and entrepreneurs around the country. We're gonna be talking about how he was able at a young age to double his income every year and retire at the age of 26. We're also gonna talk about how and where he's finding deals in today's market and how he's using creative real estate strategies like lease options and seller finance to buy houses every single day. If you have any questions, put them in the box down below. Make sure you roundhouse kick that like button. And if you like money and you like real estate, this is the show for you. Hit that subscribe button and we'll see you on the inside. Welcome to Founders Club, the show for real estate entrepreneurs. I want to give a big shout out to Chris Crone. Um, really appreciate you being on live with us here today. Um, I know that you have a really storied history of being in the real estate business. You've done uh, a few thousand real estate transactions as a real estate investor. I know that you've um, done over a billion dollars in volume, which is really impressive. So congratulations and nice work. Thank on you. That. Thanks. Um, I know you're also a best-selling author of quite a few books, which I want to get into a little bit with you. And also that you're a top mentor to real estate investors and entrepreneurs nationwide. So thank you for coming on. You're welcome. Glad to be here. You've done a billion dollars in real estate investing, investing type transactions, which is, you know, a, a huge number for most people to swallow. And uh, so maybe like 30,000 foot view. Why don't you tell us about that journey from kind of where you started to that point? Sure. So uh, when I when I got started in the game of real estate, what fascinated me so much was that real estate could mean a lot of different things. I mean, it could mean flipping and wholesaling. It could mean long term rentals. It could mean apartments, multifamily, commercial. And I thought myself, there's got to be a, a, like a best way of doing real estate. And then there's got to be a way to systematize it. And um, I'm not your creative real estate investor. I am not your uh, like looking for that one of a kind, artsy, interesting, you, you know, niche of a deal. Uh, for me, I basically wrote a book on my hypothesis that there was a highest consistent ROI version of real estate. That if it was a money game, if you want to make the most money, then there was a w way to play that game. And so, my my algorithm settled in on purchasing single family homes in the best markets, uh, below the median. They had to basically have a minimum of a 25% annual ROI um, and a little bit of other criteria. And if it met that, I would uh, execute on it. And after I did enough homes become financially free and then I went nationwide, we've now done that system to the tune of over 5,000 homes. We did pass that billion mark. And for me, real estate done that way is extraordinarily boring. The profits are extremely exciting, but it's a system now. And there's about 200 people that run and maneuver that system for me. And um Obviously, it's just one way of doing real estate. You know, I think it's the best for me who values the least time, the least effort, the least risk and the most money. But everyone values something different. So when someone values something different, they'll probably wind up with a different best system. So uh, I, I love everything that you're talking about. I love less effort, less risk, more money. I think that everyone in the audience is going to be pretty excited to kind of dive into that a little bit. Um, tell me a little bit more about the algorithm or process you went through to land on single family homes in this type of market in, in median ranges, et cetera. Yeah. So um, I, I originally was going to college to be a doctor and then I was told I was too dumb because I couldn't pass my basic chemistry classes. Uh, but stats was a different uh, story. I love statistics. And when I met my first mentors, there were three people I met who had made over $10 million in real estate and none of them worked anymore. And, um, one of them gave me the bird early on because I would like try to go to his house at midnight, knock on the door and be that annoying young early twenties kid of a, all the motivation in the world helped me. He's like, Oh my gosh, get out of here. But the other two, as I started working with them, I asked them this question. I said, okay, so you're working on a flip and this is a million dollar project and that's commercial. Like, which is best. And neither of them could give me a good answer. And they said that, that the reason why they couldn't is because it depends on what you've 
that I made a list of six things that I value. They said, okay, Chris, well, if you want to know the answer, then you need to basically compare all strategies against each other. And I, I made a list of the top 30 strategies in real estate and built out this chart. And then I compared them for what took the least time because I wanted to be fairly passive. What was the least risk? Because I valued making money, but keeping my money. I wanted to be, um, I wanted to be the least time, uh, the, sorry, the least effort. So there's hard lifts and there's difficult lifts. Uh, I wanted it to be the most profitable. I wanted it to work in up and down markets and I wanted it to provide real value for people. And so those were my six criteria that I thought were most important to me. And so when I started comparing all these strategies, I'd find out it's like, wow, flipping, flipping like without a team is a lot of work. It can make you a lot of money, but then when the deal's done, then you got to do it all over again. If you want more money, I've got buddies who have been flipping for a decade. Some of them, two decades, they've got hundreds and hundreds of deals under their belt. And they had an amazing lifestyle, but not necessarily a lot to show. Um, I was okay going slower if it would build something sustainable and residual. Um, you know, so I started comparing all these ideas out there. It's like, well, commercial usually in general takes a lot more money. Um, you know, multifamily, those are bigger takedowns. What would work for like the little guy trying to become somebody? And so this idea of a single family home below the median and either in your backyard doing a lease option with it or nationwide doing a straight rental in one of the highest cash on cash cash flow markets, some of the nuances that I'm jumping into here, uh, yeah, were some like of the that. first things that really screamed to me. So I specialize in American dream real estate. And of course, everyone laughed when they said, okay, Chris, good job. You've got a hundred deals under your belt. There's no way you can scale that. That's crazy. You need to graduate to commercial. You need to graduate to multifamily. And I said, you know what? Unless multifamily and commercial can deliver the same predictable, consistent, dependable ROI on every single deal, I'm not going to graduate to that. I'll get into that later, but not for my system. And uh, so I figured out how to scale and basically buy a house every single day without money, without credit. And, and uh, you know, I still do that today. But I'm also obviously now I'm doing multifamily and commercial and a lot of this other stuff. But, um, you know, for me, I think we get confused with strategies and tactics. And at the end of the day, probably the most important thing that I value is ROI and time. Mm -hmm. And most people are like, oh, flipping and I made 60 grand. I'm like, who cares how much you made? What was the ROI? And what was the ROI on your time, not just dollar? Because ultimately, I'm trying to be agnostic and move away from real estate and say, how do I leverage this in the most intelligent way possible so it doesn't consume me? And maybe just to kind of put a bow on it, I spend about two hours a month on my portfolio where I acquire a new home every single day without money and out credit. It's completely systematized. So it's possible, uh, but those are just some of the things that I value and where it took me. I also know early on uh, you've talked about you set a goal to double your income every year and you started yeah. at like 40000 and kept on doing that. And I know you, you're big on mindset as well and those mindset leaps that it takes to sure. go through those next levels. So I just wanted to jump into that a little bit. You know, um, listen, w without taking a whole lot of time on the science of psychology, I think we can all agree that science has proven that psychosomatic effects are real. In other words, if you can get yourself to believe it, you can make some crazy stuff happen. You can create healing in the body when the doctors say it's not possible. You can manifest money because you met that person. I don't care if we call it law of attraction or whatever, but I believe in psychosomatically getting every advantage on my side. And um, it wasn't 40,000 I made my first year. It was actually $18,600. And that was my first year in college. And I remember sitting there thinking, wow, I've never, as a college kid, I've never made this amount of money before. But on the other hand, I was also newly married because that happened real fast and I couldn't pay all my bills. And I'm like, wow, this is weird. Like this is the most I've ever made. And I have an awareness that 20 grand a year is nothing. And I knew that the average American pulled in, it's like $44,000 a year. So I thought, okay, I'm in college. I don't have to be like average adult Americans, but I believe that I'm at least average. So if I work really hard, I should be able to double my income. And even if I do and make, let's call it 40 grand, then I'll have doubled my income and, and I'll probably no longer be going into debt. And I believe that's possible. Well, I did not realize at the time that it was just my belief in the idea that was so like, no one had to twist my arm. That was, so, that was not hard for me to believe. I'm like, come on. 
I work full time. I go to school full time. My full time work should be able to produce less than the average American's income, which is double than what I've been earning this last year. So I believe that for 365 days, I bought my first house. And between the real estate beginning to happen and making a move on my second house and um, working at more of a commission based job, I was able to double my income. And I got to the end of the year and I'd made closer to 50 grand. And I thought, wow, like, I've been spending and practicing. I've habituated 365 days of believing this was possible. And when it came time for resolutions for next year, guess what? There was no way I was going to be like, oh, well, you know, let's throttle it back a little bit and figure out how to. No, I was trained. I wasn't even thinking. I didn't know that. I didn't know how you Pavlov dog a human being. I didn't know that I was set up to automatically think, well, I'll just double it again. Well, because I had practiced it for a year, it was easy for me to believe because I had hardened that belief into my reality. So I believe that I could double it again. Next year, I made 100 grand. And then the next year after that, I made 200 grand. And then the next year after that, I made almost a half a million. And I remember I was double, 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 until I got to that half a million mark. And I thought, oh, awesome. I've been doing this for a few years now. Let's just double it again. I did the math. I'm like, well, half a million times two is, wait a second. That's a million bucks. And I had a limit in my brain that I wasn't aware of that said, uh-uh. You can increase your net worth a million dollars in a year super easy. But to actually take home a million dollars, you can't do that. So I said, screw it. Let's do it. And at the end of the year, I only made a half million dollars. <laughs> and then I said, oh, must have been luck, like a fluke. Like, we'll just do it again. And the next year, I made a half million. The next year, I made a half a million. Until finally, I realized there's something wrong with my psychology. I believe that I can double my income until I no longer believe I can. We have these financial barometers in our head. And when I had a, a mentor of mine literally point that out and I broke through it that next year I played catch up and I made millions and it was nothing more than an idea that held me back. And, you know, a lot of people look at my results and I'm like, the, the, the truth is we could talk about systems and how I made it and, and all that. But I, I think the bigger truth behind all of that, this psychosomatic thing I brought up is that we only get what we believe. And so if you're struggling to get more, don't look for a better system, look for a better belief. Powerful words. Uh, and, 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 you know, a great story about just how you kind of ceiling out, ceiling out, kept hitting that ceiling, had that shift, and then were able to kind of break through to that next level. Which also kind of ties into your book, Limitless, which kind of dives into this a lot deeper. Um, so if anyone wants to check that out, highly recommend that. Um, where's the best place for them to get that if they want to check out more on the Probably Amazon or I just Google it. There you go. Wherever you buy books, it's probably there. <laughs> yep. So let's talk a little bit more uh, about another book you did was The Straight Path to Wealth. And uh, I think that's a great foundational book for everyone that's, you know, looking at real estate investing and kind of branching out into different profit streams and different strategies. Um, but can you kind of break that down a little bit? And then also, I know you give that away for free as well. So anyone that wants that, definitely check out uh, his websites for those free downloads. Yeah. So it's a great question. You know, I, uh, I didn't know as a systems guy until I got frustrated one day, someone had said that the, you know, the only dumb question is the one not asked, but at this point I was financially free and people came out of the woodworks just to get my help. And they'd ask me questions and man, I start getting the same question over and over again. I said, you know what, either they're stupid or I'm stupid because I get the same question over and over again. And I hate repeating myself. <laughs> so I wrote a book because I, when people said, okay, Chris, like, I get it. Like, how do I make my first million or my next million? And if you haven't made a million dollars, I, I said, you know, well, let's, let's write a book that would give you a blueprint for somebody with no money and no credit on exactly how to do that. And so that's what the straight path to real estate wealth is. The word straight looks misspelled. It's actually a little biblical and just making this point that straight and narrow is this path that will take people to destruction, right? Or, or you know, there's this analogy, broad is the way that leads to destruction. It's this straight and narrow path that people have a hard time finding. And, and so the book was just built on this analogy, this idea that I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say there's a best way to do real estate if you value what I value. And so uh, that book became my answer to just saying, hey, here's how you here's how you transact your first 10, 20, 30 homes. Here's how you make your first million or second or third million dollars. And then listen, from there, everyone, if you get good at making money, you'll always upgrade into better systems. But it was really built for the underdog. It was built for someone that just said, I just 
I'm just not sure how to get there. I'm like, are you kidding me? Man, it's just simple. If you're making 50 to 100 grand per property that you're holding, that's giving you $500 a month cash flow, then how do you duplicate that without being restricted by funds or credit? And, and if you can figure that out, you can go anywhere in life. You can just, you want to go fast, you want more money, you turn it up. And it's, it's like owning your private gold mine. You go in, you get what you need and you come out. And um, so that book is really a foundation piece on just my approach to how do you do it in your backyard. It does talk about lease options. It talks about buying homes. Um, with seller financing so you don't have to have money. Uh, and, and then it just systematizes it because I'm a systems guy. I really like to give people the just the A to Z. Do this, then do, do this, then do this, then do this and get this reward. So that's the way the book is set up. Yeah, it's uh, right. Well, guys, let's be let's not let's talk about what's happening in the market right now. I mean, 50 year low on rates and you take a look at the fact that we're missing, according to Wall Street Journal, 4 million homes in this country. Real estate, we're not building a bubble. We are the market is frothy and it, we, we have to eat up all of that demand before you can actually start building a bubble. I think for the next seven years, anyone that is buying real estate, especially in the next 24 months is going to look back and say, Hey, instead of making 50 grand on a, you know, shorter term buy and hold, how come I made $200,000? And I'm like, well, you know, every, every century, if you study cycles in real estate and K wave and economic breakdown, the K wave Kondratia cycle talks about four turnings. And basically every century, you've got four movements in the market, but one of the four is the biggest. The last time mm. the market was this good, Great Depression. So right now we're in the roaring 20s boom, and the next seven years are going to be dope for anyone playing the game. Then there's going to be a wicked crash, and then the real estate, then the banks are going to give it all back out for pennies on the dollar. It's going to be so cool. I definitely want to dive into this a little bit more. Uh, I think you, you're really great on the real estate strategies, and I agree that right now, you know, with – the way the market is, the way rates are low and the demand is high and, you know, uh, cost to build is high and just inventory is low. It's just it's a perfect storm of like you were saying, just things going up like crazy. Um, and I know that one of your big strategies is uh, investing in real estate with no money. So uh, you mentioned lease options and you mentioned seller financing, but just talk to me a little bit about how you're doing that now in today's yeah. market. When I bought my very first house, I got to back up a, just a hair. When I bought my very first home, my father-in-law, you know, which she and I were new to our relationship. I was wondering how that in-law relationship would be. When I bought my first home, he was confused because I was 23. That was seven years earlier than he bought his house. And I bought it after I declared I'm no longer going to be a doctor. And he was really confused at why I was doing that. But my second house, the confusion went deeper. He thought maybe my wife and I were in distress and getting a divorce. When I bought my third house, he wrote me off as just just a crazy kid because he, he thought that a home was for just a primary residence, a place where you live. And, um, when I bought, when I was getting ready to buy my fourth house, I didn't have the money for it. And, um, my father-in-law called me up at random and said, Hey, I just came back from my anniversary vacation trip. And I was thinking about your real estate. And, and I was like, well, that's, that's super bizarre that you were thinking about me on your anniversary, but more bizarre after what I felt from you on my first dealings that you would even talk to me about this. And he started asking me about my first homes the money that I was making. And, um, I, I could hear on the other side of the phone, it was an analog phone. So I could hear him writing out numbers and kind of tapping something in a calculator and found out he's calculating my ROI. And sure enough, after he did, he was blown away at how much money I was making compared to his 401k. So yes, yeah. what are you doing now? And he says, well, I got this fourth house, but I can't do it. I need 20 grand. I don't got the money. He said, I will fund it. Let's go win partners. And I was, it was like, really? Mm. And there's a lesson that I want everyone to understand here. The most powerful currency you'll ever own is your track record. And when you do something for the first time, your friends are going to say you're crazy. When you do it a second time and when your friends will say you got lucky, when you do it a third time, they do this. Huh. Yeah. And that's yeah. the turning point that once you've done it three times, there's something in our psychology that says, maybe FOMO should kick in and I'm going to have fear of missing out if I don't get in. So my father-in-law was my first partner, bought a ton of homes. And then it was later you know, uh, that I realized that I had a lot of father-in-laws out there, people that were admiring the money I was making. They couldn't do it, but they were putting money in 401ks and IRAs in the stock market. They were getting your stupid 30 or 6% go nowhere average. And when they saw what I was doing, they saw my ROIs. They said, Hmm. So it took three deals to get my first partner. After, by the time I had nine homes, I picked up four more partners and somewhere in the world right now, every day, 
someone is finding me on YouTube, social media. I get a few million views a week collectively. And, and they basically watch some of my gear, build a, a rapport with me because they spend a lot of time with me. I've got thousands of every week we publish 700 pieces of content. And, Ooh. um, after someone builds that rapport and they actually download my track record and start realizing, Oh my gosh, look at the actual addresses on the last several thousand homes. Those people say, you know what? I love real estate. I know I need to be in it. And if you are a real, if you're interested in real estate, you'll always fall into one of two buckets and you have to be honest, which bucket you belong in. The first bucket is called do it myself. And then the second bucket is called never do it myself. The do it yourself or the lone wolf, the guy that want gal that wants to go to Home Depot and fix things and, and, and talk to tenants and loves the game. You should do it yourself, but you should hopefully in the beginning have a guidance of a mentor, but all the people that are like, wait a second, I got a career or I'm good at making money or I've been stockpiling. And if I'm honest, I do not want to do any of this real estate doing. Those are the people that I serve. And um, I basically say, yo, partner up 50, 50 with me. You put up the money. I'll put up my team of experts. We'll do everything, make it as turnkey for you as possible. And what that means is that every day somewhere in the world, someone becomes my partner. And uh, within a month, we're getting properties under contract. They're in the game. They're probably spending their first couple of months, maybe two hours a month. By the third month, they're spending less than an hour a month. And after that, we just text back and forth and keep that relationship going and let the real estate do what it's supposed to do. Um, so there's a long answer. And I went all over the map to basically arrive at this idea of combining duplicatability with this whole idea of no money down. And today I've got an amazing team that is incentivized to build my entire portfolio. I check in, they have to basically dot all the I's and cross all the T's, but it means that I buy a house just about every day without money, without credit. And anyone can do that. It's called partnering. And it gets easy once you have a track record of at least three deals. Um, we're kind of in a similar boat. We, we, we're a little bit more on the multifamily side, but as we built everything up and, you know, after we, like the first one, people were like, Ooh, I don't know, you know, same kind of thing. And then, okay, that went pretty good. The second one, Oh, uh, Ooh, all right. That's, that looked like it pre went pretty good. And then the third one, they're like, Hmm, how do yes. I get in on that? Right. And then it becomes, yeah. It becomes that. So then you're leveraging your track record. You're doing more and more deals. You're able to scale by getting money from other people. Um, I want definitely want to go into that a little bit more. For the people that are interested in that, I know that investinrealestate.com is a domain where people can contact you about that partner offer. Yeah, and it's it's investinrealestatenow.com. Investinrealestatenow.com. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, definitely go check that out if you find yourself in the second bucket of, I don't want to do it myself. I just want to collect checks. A little bit more about uh, like the type of deals that you're targeting now. Like where are you seeing the opportunity? Because I know that you're, you know, obviously on single family homes. Um, mm -hmm. I know you like the no in, uh, money out of pocket kind of style. So where are you focusing market wise, property wise, that sort of a thing? Yeah, great question. So let's take a look at. I want to define what my best market. So I, I track all 324 markets around the United States, and I'm typically only investing in the top five markets. And what you'll find if you track all the proper macroeconomics, and what I mean by that is if I can find an area that is the path of progress in this country, what are the number one states people are migrating to? Where's population booming? Where do they have a supply and demand issue? Where are, where is wage growth increasing? Where are large companies moving into? Where are we expected and more employment opportunities? Um, all of these different components start telling you the areas that are going to boom. But if you can find the area that has affordable housing under the national median. So I don't believe that the national median is now 350 to 400 grand. I believe it is. 280 to $300,000. And I will track what it should be because that's what it will return to after it crashes and comes back. And I'll make all of my decisions according to that. And so right now, like for example, take a look at South Carolina, take a look at Arkansas, take a look at Alabama, Memphis, and areas of Florida. I go in and after we analyze the macroeconomics, I go ultra micro and I'll find the pockets and the neighborhoods on the right side of the railroad tracks where I also have people making $60,000 a year but for some reason, those houses are still priced at or below $200,000. I'd say $200,000 is my average purchase price right now. And wow. inventory like that is really hard to grab. But here's the thinking. Uh, and I'm going to make some predictions right here. And I'm welcome to be wrong. But I, I honestly don't think I will. 
Q2 last year, we saw the national median go up from 280 to 350. Now in many pockets around the country, it's even knocking on the door 400. I believe that in the next seven years, we'll see that number break a half a million. And I think we'll even see it potentially pass $600,000. And that means that if I'm buying a house below the median at 200,000, it literally could be worth four to $450,000 compared to the national median. And I'm planning on making a couple hundred grand per home over the next five years instead of, you know, what a 25% ROI would be, which was doubling your money, you know, putting 50 grand in and then maybe making 50 to 70 grand by the time you sell it. And I've gotten great cash flow and tax benefits. And so those are the markets uh, where I'm hanging out. And, um, and that's the philosophy. I, I love that. And just um, tactically, how are you finding that information? Is that like city data type searching or where, like, what are you looking at? Yeah, there's actually a whole bunch of, of paid services and paid reports and Cisco and things that are out there where you're dropping $800 to $1,200 a month to basically look at all this forward-facing data broken down by county. And and so that's where I go for my macro data. And um, But honestly, Google is just an amazing tool. Um, yeah. There's a lot of great articles that are written out there. And some of my recent YouTube videos are actually, if you if you look at any of the videos targeting what I call my new markets or markets I'm opening or hot markets, I'll actually show you the graphs and the maps and show you, it's like, okay, these are the 10 states everyone is leaving. These are the 10 states everyone's moving into. And these are the top three of those. That's mm. a key. Now we have to look at all the other data, but that's what we have inside of our machine. And every, we used to look at it once a year to know, hey, we're going to be in this market for seven years, shut down, open a new market. Uh, right now we're looking at that every month because the, the dynamics are shifting so volatilely. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's exciting times, exciting times to be in real estate. That's it's sure. historic. It's historic yeah. times. I'm calling this the year of the decade of the century and anyone that's ever wanted to get in the game that isn't. This will be their number one financial real estate regret. And anyone that is in the game that isn't playing better. I mean, dude, I'm telling you right now, my biggest regret of 08, I was there to buy a couple thousand homes in Phoenix and Vegas and Florida after the market just tanked. And uh, within five years, helped my investors clear over $100 million. My number one regret is that I didn't do more. I will not yeah. make that mistake. This decade is the decade. I love that. It's great advice, great predictions. I also remember those Vegas $28,000 condos and just could kick myself for not stocking up on those. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, we were buying houses. We were buying houses in Phoenix for at the auction block between 80 and 120 grand that had yeah. previously been worth 250 to 350. And sure enough, within five years of no building, it's if yeah. everyone understands the way supply and demand works, timing a bubble is easy. You just have to know when inventory shrinks down. I don't really think we're we're Wall Street Journal 4 million missing homes. I think we're 2.5 million. Um, but you can track that number every month, go down and down and down and down. And when it gets to around 400,000, you're going to see Chris Crone pull out of a lot of his markets. You're going to see him cashing on a lot of money while the market goes up another 50 grand. I'm not interested in the final 50. I'm interested in the first 100. And uh, so we'll pull out of that market and and uh, move into the nest markets, preparing for the, the mega crash, which is going to be so cool. <laughs> and uh, and these properties that you're buying, are these uh, are these off market deals? Um, are these on market deals? Uh, where are you finding these like seller financing and lease option type uh, situations? You know, the, most of the seller financing lease option stuff I'm doing, that's what I recommend for people that are local. When you go nationwide, you've got to abandon that mindset because there's just not enough of those deals out there. I'm doing both on and off market deals. Uh, and we use about 18 different methodologies. Anyone here could probably make a list of everything from literally knocking doors and doing drive-bys and talking to banks and looking at foreclosures and and just also MLS, things that are in the market. And the, you know, the secret is always going to be fast. You've got to be fast. In this market, you got to be wicked fast. But um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of flippers that we'll network with. And uh, they're not going to make the crazy gains when they get us a property, but because I can turn their money so fast, they'll, they know that I can deliver on that inventory so quickly. So it's a lot, honestly, it's a lot of networking. And I know you do talk about a lot of that stuff on your YouTube channel as well. So anyone that wants more of that, check him out. Uh, Chris Crone, Chris with a K. Um, so check that out. You talk about 
you have a big team that's combing de for deals for you and that you're, you know, you're analyzing hundreds, if not thousands of deals to just buy a couple. Um, yeah. So can you just tell me about a little bit how your team is set up and kind yeah. of who does what? Yeah. So I've got an internal team and then I've got contractors and people on the outside, if you will, but they're all there. It's this coordinated effort where we deliver to them a spec sheet. We basically say our performa is based on these 30 numbers. You find a deal, you plug in all the information, and if it meets this criteria, I'll get it under contract today. Sight unseen, by the way, because, you know, we'll, we'll go and look at it. Mm -hmm. But um, in this market, anyone that is uh, taking a night to sleep on it, you're screwed. Anyone that's yeah. taking time to, to think about it, you're also screwed. Uh, there's no time for that. That's what happens after you're under contract. Uh, so, um, you know, so it starts with the research team. After we've opened up a market, my research team will will basically keep track of every single piece of inventory in that market. And where I'm having a lot of success right now is not the obvious big markets where the hedge funds are going and setting up camp and it's hard to compete against them because they're they're long enough. They'll, they're willing to pay overpriced. I'm not. I'm targeting high growth markets for towns and cities that have 50,000 to 80,000 people. These are not major metropolises. These are not San Diego's in the making. Um, and so that's just a part of it is, is that's where we're having we're actually probably technically for growth we're out of 324 markets we're looking at the markets between 290 and 305 because we're hiding that's that's where that's where more markets are giving us more opportunity than actually going to the obvious markets where the competition is a little stupid right now like oh they just listen for 220 here's here's 290 here's my two no, i'm like shut up i'm not playing yeah. your two ninety thousand dollar offer game we're, we got to go to a place less inconspicuous or more inconspicuous yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's crazy here too like san diego that's where we're at in our backyard there's homes that go on for a million that are going for like three four hundred thousand dollars over ass just be able to just throw money at it just to tie down deals. It's so crazy right now. It's such an emotional market. And uh, it makes it really exciting because even though inventory is a little harder to get, it's so worthwhile when you win. And uh, so we're literally just adjusting our systems every day. But, you know, at the end, they have a research team that will come through all the deals. They'll plug in the preliminary numbers. Anything that looks good, we are going to race to get under contract based on the performa. I have a, there's, there's 100 figures on this sheet. But there's only one I look at, which is five years from now, what will my average total ROI be, including my cash on cash, my tax benefits, my depreciation and growth, or, um, uh, the appreciation. And that final number is ultimately going to tell me whether I say get it under contract. Once it's under contract, we will definitely do our due diligence hardcore. Uh, but so there's a research team. Once we buy these, we have our rehab teams should we need that. And then obviously we're networking with property managers and you know, we got kind of a cool strategy with PMs. You know, we go to them and we look for the mid-sized guy because I'm going to go and buy 500 homes in that market. So I'm looking for a property management company that's not mom and pop shop like, hey, we have 50 homes and I'm not looking for the behemoth of 5,000. I'm looking for a property management company that has about 500 homes because over the next year or two, if I give them 500 more, I've doubled their organization. And that level of client for them, we have a ratio that that really says, hey, do a good job managing these because if you don't, I'll yank the entire portfolio. And we're too critical to them, you know, for them. So that that bulk buying power, I think, is real. Even though my partners are all individuals, mm -hmm. I'm the common denominator that they're dealing with. Um, yeah. You know, and then after that, I've got, you know, a CFO I team that does like, all the accounting. Uh, I love that property management strategy you just kind of snuck in there because – and I, I think it actually works both ways too, because I'm sure if they've already got 500 units under contract and you're feeding them a ton more, they're probably feeding you deals all the time too, of people that want to sell before it goes on the market. Yeah, and my my property management fees range between six and eight percent um, per month instead of ten. You know, so there's a lot of when you do something in bulk, there's, there's room for deals across the board. So uh, that's one of the things that I actually look for when you're, if you were to buy, take some of this advice here and buy out of state in, in a market that I dropped and you're the one guy where you buy two homes, I'm sorry, you're nobody. If you're not part of something bigger, uh, there's just a lot, there's a lot higher risk that comes to you. So those are some of the more advanced strategies that I had to learn as I was playing the out of state game, which I did a great job losing a million dollars my first go at. And then, and then just doubled down. I said, I, I, I have to learn this game. And I'm so glad I did because I, I don't own any real estate where I live except for my house. That's it. 
And I think it ties into also you're a big learner. I hear you talk about learning a lot and kind of like keep getting better and keep getting better. And also hear you talk a lot about mentors and all that kind of stuff. So talk to me about like how mentors played a role in your life early, maybe how you connected with them and then how that's transitioned into like where you're at now. Yeah. So um, we as human beings are fairly jacked up species. Um, When you compare us to the rest of the animal kingdom, it takes us about 20 years to develop our brain. Um, compare that for just a moment to a giraffe who's, who's, who literally is born standing and maybe running as prey from a lion. Like they are developed on steroids compared to humans who are still crapping our pants a few years into the journey. And so, you know, humans, um, because we develop slow, there's some, there's some disadvantages of that. And one of them is children's minds. Uh, are really good observers to everything around them, but they're horrible interpreters. Almost no one escapes childhood without a whole series of limiting beliefs. Like I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I'm not fast enough. I'm not smart enough. You know, it's hard to make money. It takes money to make money. You know, money is evil. There's all these societal, societally accepted notions that really put these invisible ceilings, you know, on us. And I became fascinated years ago. I saw this correlation between, I mentioned psychosomatic. I saw this correlation between the psychology of the real estate between my two years, as Dolph DeRuz calls it, and my results. And I noticed that every time I worked more on me, that it impacted my results. And money is a game that touches everything. It touches your relationships, your choices. It touches, um, you know, where you can vacation, where your kids go to school. It touches the car that you drive. Most people have a really, really poor financial mindset. And I knew that I did too. I came from a poor family. And so my first mentors um, uh, honestly, I hired in the beginning, I, I want to spend time with them. I would get strategies, I, you know, ideals from them on how to make money, but the more valuable ideas in the end were never the tactics. It was always the experiences that challenged my thinking. And, um, I've now been through, you know, my, my book limitless is me documenting after having spent a couple million on mentors, my own custom created process to how you, Isolate limiting beliefs, find that which is unconscious and, and blind to you, and then how within a matter of a couple of minutes you change gears on it and turn a private weakness, an unseen weakness, into a conscious strength. And I've been through that process thousands of times and through my seminars and events, I've been able to do it thousands of people. And it's frankly, it's probably the most rewarding work that I do now is uh, is is helping people on the inside live in a manner so that their outside can become an accurate reflection of what they truly want. Most of us are getting what we don't want. So um, a lot of mentors to have gotten there. I mean, I've, man, you name it. I've, I've spent money with a lot of these people. I, I was deepest in Tony Robbins inner circle a few years back and paid 350 grand to be up there. I paid a million dollars to one mentor to be my business mentor for seven years. Um, right now I'm very, very heavy with Robert Allen and Dolph DeRoos. Um, oh, wow. I'm helping cut, yeah, um, Dolph, I think, in my opinion, is number one commercial dude on the planet. He's international. He's amazing. Uh, we're doing deals. Um, you know, but my mentors over the years have, have really shifted from uh, literally why am I fat and I don't want to be fat and I go to the gym and yet I'm still fat. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I've got an addiction to sugar. Like, why is that? And why is that there? And how do I overcome that? Um, to why, why is my marriage on the rocks and why is this woman so frustrating and I just don't understand her and why can't she understand me? Uh, you know, I'm a parent now. I got four kids. And so life, we are these multidimensional beings, but most people I think do it wrong. They're like, oh, I want more money. Focus on money. I'm like, man, if you want more money, money might be the last thing for you to focus on. You've got to get everything straight in here. And so I, I, I break it down into four dimensions. I, I think that there is who we are as a person, there's who we are to other people in the world, there's our health, and then there's wealth. And everything falls into one of those four categories. And if you're not actively seeking to become better in all four of them simultaneously, then you're gonna have some strengths and some weaknesses and your weaknesses will be your downfall. Hey, I made all this money and then I got fat along the way and had a heart attack and died. Well, that sucked. Hey, I made all this money, but then I couldn't keep it in the pants and I got divorced and I lost all my money. Like come on, everyone knows that these problems are out there. Why aren't we getting ahead of the game? Most of us are reacting to life instead of creating the life that we want. We're waiting for stuff to happen. I say, you know what? You got to get ahead of that curve. You got to ask yourself, hey, you know yourself, right? Like, you know where you're weak. You know where your addictions are. You know where you, where you become pathetic. 
you should be doing something every day to reinforce that garbage. You should be striving for the most amazing relationships, self-care. You should be striving for, yes, making money, but taking care of your real money, your health. Because in the end, you trade every last penny if you could buy more time with a healthier body. I, it's this multi-dimensional piece that I get from my mentors that I just love because how we do some things is how we do all things. And a little bit of, of improvement over here usually reflects in everything. It sounds like they've had a really big impact on your life. And, and I've also had similar experiences with mentors. And I also hear you say that you paid a lot. And that's something that we've also done over the years is just pay to be in the right rooms, pay to get yes. coaching from the right people. Um, but I think a lot of people are scared to look do that or they have like a negative thing about it. Um, and, and I'm a big believer in like, that's the, that's the shortcuts to success. Like it is. If, they can, if they can get you the right connections or the right tweak to your business or the right thing, if, you know, and to this day, we still pay a hundred grand a year to be in masterminds and different things. And, and the ROI for us is, is always much more than we spend Huge. just based on the connections, relationships, yep. partners, uh, all that. Well, for just a moment, think about this. Like we're taught society to be good boys and girls, get good grades, go to college, get a piece of paper that says you're smart and then go put your future in someone else's hands. And by the way, they'll control your hours and when you can go to the bathroom and how much you're worth. That whole system is garbage. Like it is so infuriating that so many people tolerate it, yet 85% of us, according to Gallup polls, hate it. We hate the system and yet we conform to it. And, um, you know, I... I didn't realize when I was in college why I had a hard time enjoying my experience. And it was because I wasn't meant to be put in such a tiny box. And I don't think most of us are. It doesn't mean, by the way, that that entrepreneurship or, or employment with another company is a bad idea. But everyone here should be seizing their own financial destiny. Everyone should have a way to progress and just think, man, you got this one life to live. And so you, you look at the system. The system has no real path of success for you. So at one day when I was at the most painful point in my life, which was, I feel like I had a nervous breakdown and a midlife crisis as a 22 year old. I'd been married for only four months and I found out just after that I wasn't gonna be a doctor. I'd set my heart on that. Had no idea what I was gonna do with my life. I found my wife in tears at home and it wasn't because we couldn't afford rent that next week. It wasn't because we couldn't afford tuition in three weeks. It was because she couldn't put food on the table. She had already spent all the money, which was like nothing. And we were that poor that how did I wind up in America and, and not be able to feed my wife, myself? I'm like, well, you could argue you're a college kid. College kids are supposed to be poor. Not in my view, not in my world, not in this abundant world that we live in. And it was in that moment that I made a decision that if I really wanted to live an extraordinary financial life, that no university could ever contain that secret. So I said, the ultimate shortcut is obvious. Go to somebody that's done it a thousand times over pick your biggest number and find someone that has done it 100 to thousand times bigger than that will ever be and then you you pay whatever price you write any you stroke any check you get on planes i don't care what you're don't whine to me about sacrifice don't give me none of that you pay whatever price you have to to get in their airspace because that is the only person on the planet that actually has hope for you and yeah there's no guarantee it'll work but you know what it's the best shot I believe that any human has if you want something extraordinary. Now, if you want a mediocre life, that disgusts me. But if you want that, then don't listen to any of this advice. I love that. Uh, very well said. Uh, couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, again, like it's it's only paid off for us every time we've done it. You know, to your point, when you want to do something, figure out something, implement a marketing plan. Go to that person, go to find someone who's done it at the highest level and yeah. offer them something to, to get in with them. And, and, yeah. uh, and that's, you know, the easiest way to make things work for you. It'll always be the best shortcut. Tony, Tony Robbins calls it, he says it's called proximity. And he says the most powerful thing on the planet is being in the airspace and learning at the feet of those who have gone before who are willing to share it with you. Yeah. Um, man, I, I, I hope everyone takes that one to heart because I seriously would not have anything that I do right now without that. Cause that was my cheat to the top of the mountain. Cool. So uh, we're just wrapping up here. Just have a couple final questions for you. Um, I know you're big on systems and automation and things. So more just curious, like what are some of your favorite tools, apps, softwares that kind of help you run 
smooth, efficient, fast, profitable, all that. This is going to sound a little low tech, but I, I think it starts with how you manage your time. And there's a lot of people out there that have these never ending to-do lists. Uh, we got to do this. We got to do that. We got to do that. And um, I have found for me personally that a, a way more efficient approach to how I manage my time, I'm going to start with that, is that instead of being a to-do list, I book it directly on my calendar. I never have a to-do list. My goal is to keep my calendar as empty as possible and to say no to everything. Because my philosophy is, if you want something done right, don't do it. And that's because we all get into this Sigma lone wolf mentality of I do it by myself. And when someone, you know, obviously the people watching this are entrepreneurs and real estate investors, and you're the worst at this belief that if you want it done right, then you have to do it yourself. My dad tried to teach that to me. That's why no I said, one can do it as good as you. <laughs> and by the way, as long as you believe that, you will reinforce that bias. But the moment you humble yourself and realize, wait a second, I, I bet there's people that can do it better than me, or at least at the level it needs to be done. The moment you open up for that, guess what happens? They appear. So you've got to be looking for the right things instead of reinforcing them, looking for the wrong things. And so um, if you want something done right, don't do it yourself. You should, you should literally be delegating. You should know the dollar per hour of everything you do. So just a couple of ideas here. Number one, no to-do lists. Instead, book it on your calendar. And your goal is to keep your calendar as empty as possible. Love it. Um, the second thing that I always recommend people do is if you really want to get ahead, you have to know the value of your time. So as an entrepreneur and real estate investor, there are probably, you could easily make a list of 10 things that you do. But if you were to put a dollar per value on each of them, only one, two, or three of them would be financially meaningful. You should figure out what is meaningful and stop doing the other seven. Mm. Because if you're making good money over here, you're going to take this little sacrifice and you're going to pay someone to do the other side. And at first you're going to go, oh no, that's money that I should be putting in my pocket. No, value your time. Rather do nothing and have less money than be busy with not the money that you want. And if people will actually hold the line on that, there's going to be a game changer in there. I remember the day I stopped making my own PowerPoints. I remember the day that I stopped driving my own car. I remember the day that I stopped doing things that ordinary normal people do. Man, I, I probably, honestly, if you get to know me, I'm probably looking like the laziest person on the planet because there's only a handful of things that I do and everything else I have done for me. I have chefs in my house. I have people privately teaching my children. Um, I have people that drive me around. Uh, and it's not because I'm rich snob. It's because... I've done the math. Do the math on your time. Make a list of what you do and figure out what is truly valuable and then figure out anything that doesn't at least make X, you say no to. And then here's part two. The next thing you say yes to has to make double your highest thing. And if it doesn't make double your highest thing, say no. Mm. And if you do that, you'll have more time. That's good. And when you have less time, it's because you've got a lot more money. And then soon you'll hand those things off too. Yeah, that's really good. And ultimately, like what you're saying right now, in my opinion, is the key to scaling any business. It's yeah. doing less, outsourcing more, uh, leveraging your team more, you know, kind of exactly like you're saying, try to clear your schedule and really find people that are as good or ideally better than you to do most of all of those other things. I'll share just one more rule. My other rule is that anytime my business has a new initiative, I am only allowed to be involved for 90 days. After that, if it can't live, breathe, and excel on its own, then I say no in the first place. That's really good. They're That's just really standards. Good. They're standards, yeah. and we all need to have no standards. I didn't know that we were supposed to have them. That's why my first 10 years in business honestly really sucked. Uh, mm -hmm. And then when I figured out what my standards were, everything just every year doubles triples or quadruples um and that's because you start saying yes to the right things and you say no to the right things and then every time you can delegate you do delegate and that's a key skill and a lot of people don't do it they just to your point they want to be the lone wolf they want to do it all themselves they think they can do it better and at the end of the day uh i'm not you don't really want to be doing everything so um last one to wrap with i know you're a big family guy and uh, i have two young boys myself and i like to ask all of my guests you know how would you coach young kids to be successful in life 
Um, I've never been asked that before on a podcast. So kudos to you because that's a very, very thought-provoking question. Um, I believe in customizing each of my children's education. And so for me, it's uh, there's not one way fits all. Uh, it, for me, it starts first with teaching them to connect with themselves and have personal confidence. And so I do belief breakthrough with them. We establish every time they get hurt or upset or angry, I sit down with them and I just say, what are you feeling? And then they'll tell me, and then the belief will come out. Well, Daniel hurt me. Like, wow, why, why does that hurt you? Because he shouldn't do that. Well, are you sure? How do you know? that he shouldn't do that. I mean, he is your brother. You can't make him not do it. And, and through this conversation, what we expose is the ideas that limit and separate them from the ideas that don't. And uh, it doesn't always work, but often my kids are sitting back and actually stepping into a higher and better belief system. And I feel like the, that, the, that for me as a parent teaching my children to win, yeah, I'm teaching them business. Yeah, I'm teaching them real estate. I'm doing the finance stuff. But I think that it... That, that doesn't even necessarily mean it's their journey in life. For me, it's all about taking the time with my children to teach them self-respect, self-love, build confidence, know that they're enough, know that they're capable, and that they, if they're doing it right, they're going to screw up, and that's good. You have to suck if you want to become brilliant at something. And so it's all about promoting failure, but always getting back up again. Most people will learn to try something three times and then bail and give up. And that's what a child does. But then as an adult, we do the same thing because it's a pattern. And so I'm mm. teaching my children. It's like, hey, 19th time. Yeah, baby. Come on. Let's go. Maybe 20 will be different. And that psychology of never giving up and that stick with itness and believing in yourself and having a concept of self that is positive is I think that that is the foundation of whatever it is they're going to choose to do with their life, uh, where they're going to find the greatest success. Yeah, I, I totally agree. That was a very powerful answer. Um, I think, you know, instilling that confidence early, I think is the key. I think the rest can be figured out, right. But if they've got a, a strong core and a hard outer shell, they can probably be, uh, be out there and winning. And I love the quote that, uh, you've got to suck to be brilliant <laughs> again, you know, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Welcome. For coming on. And, uh, hopefully we can do this again. Um, if you guys have any questions, put them in the box down below. We'll circle back and we always get back to everyone on all of your questions. Um, definitely connect with Chris, check him out on YouTube, check him out on invest in real estate now.com. Definitely check out his books and, uh, really appreciate you, Chris. Thanks a lot. We'll see you guys on the next one. You're welcome. Thank you.